I would say it's knowing your target market, what their problem is, and knowing that your solution solves that problem and being able to determine that very quickly in the sales process so that you don't waste your time because you don't want to be spinning your wheels because there is one thing I have discovered in sales is that people, for some reason, do not like to say no. They will tell you any other excuse but no. And you want a no as a salesperson. If it's a no, you want it as early as possible. You don't want to be dragged out with a maybe, or I don't know, or I need more time, or I don't have the money. Those are all what we call false objections. And so I think one of the biggest things is, is getting to that no and not being afraid of it. That no is a gift. It has just saved you hours of time. You have discovered that that is not a prospect for you. You need to move to the next one until you find the person who is your prospect. Then you consult with them and help them solve their problem. In this episode of The Health Hustle, we dive deep into Nate Taylor's entrepreneurship journey, some of his early days of working with Mark Cuban, the aha moment that sparked Keyspan, which is his current venture. We'll explore the gym as a clinic model, the importance of sales, even as an introvert like myself, and how to find product market fit in a rapidly evolving industry. Get ready for an inspirational conversation packed with actionable advice, personal anecdotes, and a whole lot of hustle. Let's go. Test again for me. Test, test, one, two, three. Testing, one, two, three. Kick okay. it over here, baby pops. Let all the fly skimmers feel the beat. <laughs> what was that? You let, you said something about an album, right? Did you rap or like what's your? <laughs> no, I don't rap. <laughs> okay, but you did mention something about that. I, I do have an album on Spotify. Yeah, crazy. Yeah. Nate Taylor, welcome to the show. How you doing, man? Doing great. Thanks for putting us outside today. It's a great day. It is. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. Um, and what I love about your story and why I wanted to bring you on is that you have the classic. Um, you ran into a problem you decided to figure out how to solve that problem and then you ultimately turn it into a business. Yeah. And that's always my favorite stories because it's something that the founder can relate with. Um, and so before we dive too deep into Keyspan though, I wanna rewind a little bit um, because you seem to have an interesting start in terms of how you even got into business and how you got into sales. But even before that, um, I'd like to ask, how are you sleeping? Very well. I've, I, that is the one gift I was born with. I, uh, I sleep well. As long as I go to bed at a reasonable hour, I'll get the sleep. Good. Um, only recently since starting a business have I had, uh, and I can count them on one hand, nights where I wake up at like three with a little bit of anxiety. Mm. Like, oh, my to-do list was so long I didn't get it finished the night before. Yeah. Uh, but usually I'm pretty good about sleep. Are you happy about that decision though, to be in a place where like you have a little stress about something you care about? I feel like a lot of people like, even though they feel it, they're glad it's theirs and they don't have any regrets about it. Wouldn't trade it for the world. Yeah. 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 It's awesome. I feel the same way. Yeah. Um, I love to ask that question because I feel like it's more revealing than just like, how are you? Like, yeah. I know you've asked that question before, so. Um, cool, so let's rewind a little bit to your story. So you kind of got your start in an interesting place with working with Mark Cuban. You mind sharing that story? Yeah. Uh, so I didn't work directly for him. I worked for his director of sales. So I was uh, an intern on the sales side. Uh, I was a sophomore in college. It was my first summer job. And uh, they set me up there and I was selling streaming services. So if y'all remember, broadcast.com was the first to sort of invent streaming where you could click play. You didn't have to wait for it to download. And uh, we were selling it to companies to do their earnings reports on the internet, which was revolutionary at the time. <laughs> now looking back though, it's just, it's like talking Different about world. the Model T Ford. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> How old are you? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> and uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun uh, working there. It was very high paced. There was nothing my university was teaching that really I thought directly applied to the world of the internet business. They, mm. they were just making these rules up, making up how to do business on the internet. And of course, there were some similarities to uh, analog business, but there were a lot of differences in terms of reach, speed at which things were done. Um, it was just a fun, fast-paced environment. What did you feel like you took away from it? That I think the key thing was is to 
for me to be able to sell something, I have to one, believe in it. I have to two, be excited by it. And three, it has to be something that other people want. Mm. Uh, I have also sold something that people don't want, and that is probably the hardest thing to do on the planet. Yeah, I was going to say, what do you do in that circumstance? Because I feel like a lot of people- Get another and, job. Yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, it has to be, it's rather that or find a way to believe in the product or service. Well, in the case where they didn't want it, I believed in the service. Mm. It just, there was, it didn't have product market fit. I feel like that's like encompassing just so much business in general, right? Yeah. Not even necessarily sales, but just yeah. like feed a starving crowd, in other words. Yeah, well, I mean, business is sales. Yeah. Sales is business. I right. Mean, it, you know, sales have always had sort of a dirty connotation, I think, throughout history. Right. Uh, but it's the it's the bedrock of every business. I find it very interesting how I was just having a conversation with some buddies of mine when I was in Florida about the concept of recognizing what business you're actually in, especially in the health industry. Um, is you see this a lot, especially with specifically gyms, is that a gym isn't necessarily in the business of selling like just training and getting people healthy. They're more in like the sales and marketing business of like, how can I drive more sales and marketing to basically keep the lights on versus just like trying to get people fit? It's like you get into the business wanting to get people fit and then realize you're actually in the sales and marketing business. And I think that happens more often than not for most businesses, especially in the health space. Um, so I'm just curious as to like, how do you how do you balance that in an industry that's like, it seems like so many people that I talk to in the health industry are just so resistant to that, right? Is like, I don't want to charge money. I don't want to do sales. I don't want to feel salesy. like. How do you balance that in an industry that's so resistant to it? I'm not sure I have the answer to that. Mm. Um, I would say that that probably has a lot of parallels with doctors who are going into the world of business. Uh, they're there to help people. They're not there to run a business. They didn't go to school to run a business. And you know, probably looking at your QuickBooks and your spreadsheets every day is not your idea of helping people get fit. Uh, but I think it's essential that if you have a motivating why that is at your core and really driving you to achieve an outcome, which in this case would be to help people get fit, if that drive is strong enough, I think it can overcome any of those resistance to or shortcomings with business and understanding that, okay, you know, two hours a day I have to do things I don't like. Yeah. And uh, that's going to help me be able to do this two, three times, four times more hmm. at bigger scale. Did sales choose you or did you choose sales? In, all, in other words, like why and how did you get into it in the first place? Yeah, I think I was sort of just born genetically for sales. Really? Yeah. I just, I just walked through life just selling life. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Like where did that start for you or, or why even? Do you know? Uh, well, I, I realized very early on in life, if I wanted to play a particular game on the playground, well, I had to convince the other people that this was the game that you needed to play. So mm -hmm. sales, mm -hmm. I had to go and lobby for that, give them the pros, give them the cons to what else they were trying to do. And it's like, no, we're going to play tag or we're going to play soccer. You know, uh, when did you discover that that's what you were doing though? Cause as a kid, you don't know that. Oh no, I didn't know that as a yeah. kid. Like when no, did no. you, when did you like discover that path, I guess? Uh, when I got out of college and had my first job out of college. Hmm. Yeah. That's when I realized, oh, I'm, I'm in sales. That's what this is. Do you feel like there's certain personality traits that gravitate towards that, that you have that maybe others don't? Uh, so I, uh, I did sales and led some teams in, in China, which was interesting for me. Um, because I had traditionally always gone into that thinking, oh, it has to be the extrovert. It has to be someone who's very comfortable uh, going and just, you know, doesn't know a stranger type personality uh, and who is quick to be able to respond to, you know, objections or questions or changes in mood or temperament in terms of the person you're talking to. Uh, but when I was in China, I quickly learned with some of the folks that I managed that they were both culturally and personality wise introverts. And that made me take a step back and start reading literature about the power of the introvert. What can the introvert bring to the sales process? So 
I would say the ones who more naturally are drawn to sales are the extroverts just because it's something they're born doing and it's what they are very comfortable with. But I have seen some very successful salespeople who are introverts come in because they're very process oriented. They're very detail oriented and they're very purposeful with every conversation that they have. Yeah, they probably go home and collapse at the end of the day <laughs> into a ball and like, no, I don't want to see anybody. Uh, but, you know, that was really rewarding for me to encourage the, ex the introverts on my uh, team um, to not try to be an extrovert. Lean into being the introvert, lean into your strengths and your power as that introvert. And you're going to unlock a lot of things that the extroverts can't. Hmm. So do you think it's more or less just like strategy and less about personality type? And what I mean by that statement is like when I'm thinking about those two guys I was mentioning before, two of my best friends who are, they're in real estate, extreme extroverts. Yeah. They're like a 12 out of 10 <laughs> extroverts. And uh, they love to just like, like I was even making fun of one of them. Like he like can't even get off the couch or sit down without making some noise. Like things just always have to be coming out of his mouth. Like, ah, mm, yeah, just like always. Right. Just, it just never stops. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and so like, I would say their strategy, I mean, this might just be the industry, but it could, and that's why I'm, I'm going back to personality type is that it's often like a lot of cold calls, a lot of networking, just a lot of conversations at the it end is. of the day. Right. Versus the interest introvert strategy might be a little bit more strategic, maybe less conversations, but more intentional um, and more process based, like you mentioned. Um, but I just I just would be curious as to like what your thoughts on that is like, do you think it's more understanding thyself and leveraging that? Or is it just like 50 50 wash, like they're both equally good rather regardless of the strategy? You know, without wanting to lean in and say anything that would be favoring one or the other. Uh, I would say it's probably easier for the extrovert to just jump in and go. I think the introvert, that's the right, the extrovert easier for them to jump in the introvert. Uh, I think would require some additional steps of process and pre-planning and thought and I kind of, you know, self-talk to themselves. All right, we got this. We're going we're gonna to do 20 cold calls today. I'm going to check this off my list. And I'm going to take the next five days off from humans. Five days off, yeah. I know because that's me. And uh, I think, uh, so I definitely think it's easier for the extrovert. And you find the industry is filled with more extroverts than introverts. But uh, it's, it's possible for both. Yeah. Yeah. Cause like, like I said, I'm more speaking to myself than anything. Cause I'm definitely in that latter camp of, uh, I could do it. I can be a chameleon. I can take the shape and form as needed. But when I get to the end of the day, exactly like you said, it is a crash on the couch. I mean, not literally, but human wise is I don't want to engage with anybody, which is why my scenario now is wonderful. Is like, I'm pretty much home alone all day, most days, not really engaged with humans. And then I'll like stack on the calls that I need to on certain days or at the end of certain days. Uh, but I try to avoid them at all costs for the most part. But yeah, I can I can totally relate with the the introvert side of things. Um, curious as to so worked for Mark Cuban, did sales for a myriad of times for what looked like multiple companies from yeah. LinkedIn to Canva, I think was one of them, and there was a whole bunch of companies. With all the companies that you worked with, can you maybe distill down like what some of the big lessons are learned, how maybe they differentiated with different companies that you worked with. And even from the standpoint of like, what is like one-on-one -on -one scales look like compared to like, we'll say executive or enterprise sales, like large level sales. Mm. I mean, I, I got to imagine there's some huge differences between those as well. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's a big question. Probably need to unpack that in a few steps. Yeah. Uh, I think one of the biggest lessons I learned was my job working for this, this crazy media company. Uh, it's not in existence anymore, but it was called media plus and then world media group. <clears throat> and uh, this would take me every three months, I would move to a new country and I would walk in with a new press badge and a new title working for a different press, you know, Dietzeit, Tiger Spiegel, Le Mans, Telegraph, CNBC Europe, you name it. Uh, and we would have three months to go in and collect content. So do interviews and interview presidents, prime ministers, their cabinets, the business leaders in the country 
and create a compelling report, which is like a promotional report for that nation. You know, what are the economic opportunities? What are the tourism opportunities? Uh, and then we would have to simultaneously sell the advertising. And it was a high pressure sales job. You had one meeting to do it. There were no follow ups. You had to get the signature on the site. Uh, and that was really where I learned my my sales chops, I think. Um, but my big takeaway from that was that everyone's basically the same. Human nature is the same. And sales goes to the core of human nature. You have a need. You have a solution. You're going to provide that and make it as easy as possible to provide a solution for that need. Now, there will be cultural nuances or corporate nuances that you have to learn to navigate. And that's when you really get into the enterprise side of things. But at the core of it, sales is just human behavior. It's human emotion. I have a need. You're going to make my life easier. Or you're going to help me get a promotion. Or you're going to help me achieve my goals. Or whatever it might be. And you provide that solution. So that was probably the biggest thing that I learned. No matter the, the country, the culture, the language, the core of the sale was always the same. What do you think the overlap is then between sales and marketing? Because you're far more skilled at sales, but my world is more in the marketing side of it. And because when you're talking about this, I feel like there's, I do the same thing just in a different medium, right? And what I mean by that is that I'm constantly thinking about just human behavior and what motivates human behavior. And it's at the end of the day, it's psychology. Marketing at the end uh -huh. of the day is psychology, which I'd argue sales is probably the exact same thing in a lot of ways. Yeah. And so don't get me wrong, I know there's overlap, but I'm curious as to like how you think about it versus how I think about it in regards of kind of attacking the same problem, right? Yeah. Because ultimately we're just trying to motivate people to make a decision in some direction. Right. Like towards or away, often case. Um, so yeah, I'm just curious what you think that overlap is between the two. Yeah, I, I oh, there's definitely an overlap. Um, and I can just tell you, hands down, I have worked for companies that have well-known brands because they market and they advertise and that awareness is what I think is the core value that the marketing brings to the sales table. And this again, this is from the point of view of a sales guy. So <laughs> take it with a grain of salt. Love it. Uh, I have worked for brands who are well known like Canva, like LinkedIn, and being able to open that conversation about providing the solution. Oh, it's just so much easier. I mean, it's not, it's a, it's a cakewalk, right? That, opening is not really part of the sales process anymore. It's straight into solving the problem. Whereas I have worked for companies where the brand is not known at all. And then that is a much longer sales process for us because the marketing is not there. We have to educate. Then they have to get social validation. Then they might get to the point where they're comfortable entering into that conversation. Yes, from the very beginning, we've had a solution that can solve their problem, but because they're not aware, they're not comfortable with, the brand is not known, they don't have social proof, all these things that the marketing provides, the sales then has to do that in a one-on-one -on -one context. And it makes it a lot harder and it makes the sales cycle a lot longer. So I kind of feel like they go hand in hand. That is honestly one of the best descriptions of that that I've heard. And that actually even gives me a lot of clarity behind it because it's it's almost like it's on a, a pendulum in a lot of ways, right? It's like if your brand and your marketing is really strong, it requires less sales skills and then vice versa happens. If your brand and marketing is super weak, it requires a lot stronger sales skills, right? And most people are probably somewhere in the middle, but it just tells you, and if you're good at both, then you're friggin' unstoppable, frankly, uh, at the end of the day. But Interested. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. I guess I didn't think about it like that. Yeah. Huh. Um, okay. So knowing that, uh, oh, before I get into the next question, I want to ask you, what was it like working at LinkedIn? I'm obsessed with LinkedIn. It's like the main platform that I use. Uh, I'm on it every single day, all the time. It's like where most of my lead gen comes from. Yeah. What was that experience like? Man, without sounding like a cliche, I think LinkedIn was sort of the Silicon Valley dream uh, that just came to life. Like I was there under Jeff Weiner. He was a phenomenal leader. Like people admired him. They looked up to him. The people we worked with were A players. They were awesome to work with. Leadership was great. The product was great. We solved problems for people. Our clients were happy. Uh, the perks were awesome. Uh, it was just all around a great experience. I, I have nothing but fond memories from my time with LinkedIn. Why'd you leave? Uh, had better opportunities. And I, I boomeranged. I left LinkedIn, came back to LinkedIn left LinkedIn, 
one of the things that LinkedIn always asks in the beginning uh, uh, interview is, what do you want to do when you leave LinkedIn? And it's called tour of duties. They would always be very big on these things of tour of duties, and they would usually last two years. Uh, and you'd have a tour of duty that you'd come in, you would do that, and then they'd be like, all right, this tour is kind of up. It's time for you now to move up or move on, whatever you want to do. They don't want you just languishing in the same position and just kind of doing the same thing and spinning your wheels again and again. Uh, and most of the employees who work there don't want that either. Um, and so, you know, my first switch was when I was moving back from Hong Kong to the United States. Uh, I was determined to live in Austin. LinkedIn didn't have an office in Austin. Mm. I was going to work remote from there. Do they now? No. Wow. That actually shocks me. Yeah. So many tech companies here. I know. Weird. It's interesting. Um, they were going to let me work remote here, but then I there was a local tech company here. Uh, it's now called Koros. It was called Spreadfast at the time. Several of my friends worked there. And over dinner, they're like, no, you're not going to LinkedIn. You're coming to work for us. Just go ahead and tell them. I'll figure it out. They got me an interview. Uh, they, you know, met the price I said, and I was like, "All right, well, let's do it." You got sold. <laughs> got sold. Uh, and then <laughs> two years later, I went back to LinkedIn. They called me and said, "Hey, we're starting a new company inside of LinkedIn called Elevate. Um, do you want to come back?" And I was like, "Yes, but I want to stay in Austin and work remote." And they're like, "It's fine. You can do that." Um, so I did. And then two years after that. Um, a guy I've always, who I worked with back at Rackspace days and have always told, John Itell's his name, great sales leader, always said, John, if there's ever a chance for me to work with you again, I would love to work with you again. You've been one of the best leaders I've ever worked under. Uh, I think you do great things and you, you, you make good choices in picking the companies. And he called me one day, we had lunch. He was like, I'm interviewing with this company called Canva. And this was kind of before Canva took off. Uh, so it started by like a brother and sister or something, right? A uh, husband and wife or okay. boyfriend and girlfriend. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, dynamic duo, great company as well. And he said, I think this could be the next big thing. Uh, and my Elevate uh, business was actually winding down. They were folding it into the company and making it a free feature instead of a paid feature. So it was actually just the timing just worked out great. And I just slid right into there. You reminded me of when I was transitioning out of healthcare as an occupational therapist and looking for that next thing. I actually remember LinkedIn had a program where they were taking in like basically people with like degrees that weren't necessarily like tech related, whether it was like the healthcare industry or whatever. Uh, and I remember like having a lot of respect for the fact that they were creating programs to get fresh eyes and new people and just like industries you wouldn't expect like yeah. into the, the LinkedIn culture just to like take new perspective and also to like train people on skill sets that I'm sure they probably needed. So I'm sure it was probably partly selfish, but just like training people on skills that they wanted to learn. Um, I remember that actually just now remember that I remember that being a really cool part of something they were doing. I'm sure they probably do similar things now. Yeah. But. They do it with the military as well, bringing in veterans, training them up, uh, and they do it with college grads as well. Huh. They got good programs for that. So man, you've, you've had more career changes than a chameleon has colors. Um, so crazy. I mean, you, you've been in software media. I think you mentioned geopolitical intelligence at one point. I don't even know what that is real estate, um, and now health. So based on all those experiences and all those different industries, um, first of all, why? <laughs> and is it, it like, what have you learned? I mean, based on all those experiences from all the different industries, like, would you change anything? Would you do anything differently? What, what's the big takeaway and lessons from being in so many different areas? Uh, that my brain has to be engaged in something that I'm fascinated with for me to stay focused. Um, poster child for ADD. Okay. <laughs> Not one of those people who's like, Oh, I discovered it when I was 20. No, I was diagnosed at like five and used to go and talk to other kids about how to manage ADD. Do you like newness? Oh, I love it. Do you addicted to it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's why, you know, live, and traveled and worked overseas for 12 years, just new experiences all the time. You said what, four continents I read? Yeah. What, which one's your favorite? I mean, each continent's amazing for its own reasons. Hmm. No so, favorites? No, no okay. favorites. I mean, there are a few I spent more time in than others, like South Africa or Hong Kong uh, or uh, Holland. Um, but every country has its 
pluses and negatives. Yeah. Yeah. So on all the the need for newness and discoveries and trying new things, is there any that peak your memory that are top of mind for you or most unique or well I, I think the one that kind of derailed me for a short while was the geopolitical intelligence thing i got to basically play spy uh, so it's a company called stratfor they're not around anymore uh and they're a private geopolitical intelligence agency so a bunch of ex guys from the cia and state department security and intelligence services uh, and what were you doing for them i was doing sales for them what were yeah. you selling? I was selling. So they had two arms of their business. One was a media arm that you would sell subscriptions for geopolitical forecasting. So they would forecast what's going to happen based on the philosophy of geopolitics, meaning that the geography determines uh, what a country is going to do and how it's going to behave. So, for example, the invasion of Ukraine was something that had been seen since the breakup of the Soviet Union. Uh, geopolitical forecasters have been saying it's just a matter of time before Russia invades Ukraine because of Russia's geography. Russia is very um, susceptible to invasion by land forces coming from the West across the flat plains of Poland, Ukraine, straight up to the doorsteps of Moscow, which has been done by Napoleon, Hitler, and um, a couple of other times throughout their existence. And so regardless of who is the leader of Russia, there is something deeply embedded in their psyche of uh, insecurity on their Western border and having enemies uh, or adversaries that are very close to their center of their homeland, the Moscow area, is a threat to them. And they need a buffer zone. And so Ukraine is part of that buffer zone. Hmm. It's just a matter of time. No kidding. Yeah. Interesting. So they would use that sort of philosophy to be able to predict things. And you were selling media? So that was one thing, these media reports that would come out every day. Okay. Uh, and then on the other side, they would do special projects. Uh, for companies like oil companies going into a country, they would assess the risk to them, to their assets, give them an underlying understanding of the political um, situation within the country, the parties, who are the power brokers, who are not the power brokers, where can they get things done, and where are their risks. Wow, definitely a world I obviously know nothing about. Uh, I knew nothing about it other than reading books about spy stuff, and just like, this is really cool. Did you get it's recruited? Somebody, I mean, who sold you into that job? Uh, a friend of my brother-in-law's, uh, one of my brother-in-law's best friend's dad was the president of the company at the time. They were based in Austin hmm. and I was home over Christmas for the holidays looking for, I don't know what I was looking for, but <laughs> something <laughs> I, new. Yeah. They said, Hey, uh, you should go check out this company. You should talk to George. George Friedman's a, uh, well-known author and geopolitical strategist. Are they still around? Uh, he's still around. Yeah. Is the business still around? Uh, no, Stratford has morphed into something else. I don't even know what it's called anymore. Uh, but George is out, started his own, I think, Friedman Geopolitical Futures or something uh, is the name of it. Uh, an industry that I has always piqued my curiosity, but I never got into it is actually cybersecurity. Mm. And I was just telling my girlfriend this the other day is like, it is something that I would, I'm, I'm curious about and I'd like to learn more about, but the idea of doing a career in it, and I don't know, I've never done it, but here's my assumption. My assumption is, is it's really stressful. And the reason that that's my assumption is because if you make one mistake and you have a data breach, people are angry and it's your fault. And that sounds stressful as hell. <laughs> so it's like, do I really want that? I don't know. Uh, I'd like to learn about it, but to make a career out of it, maybe not. Um, I got a good book for you to keep you up at night. I think it's called, uh, this is how they say the world is going to end. It's by a New York times investigative journalist. Okay. And she just does a whole report on zero day exploits, which are all these back doors to everything from our energy grid to your iPhone. Uh, and just how scary those things are. Like they're like accessible, like somebody could find a way in there. Yeah, they're traded on the black market. Like North Korea's buying them. No. Yeah, Iran's buying them. And get out of here. Yeah, it's pretty scary. Maybe I should get into cybersecurity. I mean, that's <laughs> I mean, that's the other side of it too, is like I just gotta think it's lucrative as hell. Like, I mean, if you can solve problems like that, like global plot problems, it's worth a lot of money to people. Yeah. Like yeah. anyways, uh, I digress. So you eventually turned forty. And uh, I feel like this was kind of the birth of Keyspan, if I, if I remember correctly. Yeah. You mind sharing that story? Yeah. I uh, turned 40, um, decided I was going to go uh, meet some friends and 
run with the bulls. That was smart. <laughs> Literally? Uh, yeah. Oh, well, cool. Yeah. Uh, so we met in Pamplona and <laughs> off we went. Newness. Newness. Give me all the newness. Let's do it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> turned over to my wife one day and, you know, had a, uh, a, uh, newborn or a one-year-old and, uh, another one on the way. And I just looked at my wife and I said, I am way too young to be feeling this old. I, like I gotta go see the doctor. Like this isn't right. What's going on? Uh, and at this point in my life, I'd basically spent my whole life with the slogan of work hard, play hard. You can sleep when you're dead. And so I just wouldn't sleep because it's too much to do. Uh, I wasn't exercising. I was drinking. I fell in love with wine. And uh, I, um, yeah, I love chicken fried steak, you know, just just destroying myself. Is and that, uh, is that a popular thing in Waco? Chicken fried steak? It's a popular thing in Texas. Yeah. <laughs> okay. If you haven't had it, go to the Blue Bonnet Cafe, get yourself some chicken fried steak. All right, fair. Um, so I went to the doctor and got a blood test. It was a pretty basic blood test, but she comes back and she's like, well, your liver count's high, drinking. Your testosterone's low, not exercising, poor diet. And your cholesterol's high, poor diet, not exercising. She's like, well, I got the solution. I'm just going to put you on testosterone. You're going to feel great. It's going to be awesome. I'm like, all right, cool. I don't know anything about this stuff. Uh, went home, got on it for about a month. Uh, and luckily, I had some people around me that were doctors and other very intelligent people. And they told me to do some self-research on this and I should look into it. Was and it I, injections or cream? It's just cream, topical okay. cream. It was a mild, mild dose. Uh, and I quickly discovered uh, that this was a terrible thing for a healthy male age 40. Like, there's no reason why I need to be on testosterone. The reason my testosterone is low is because of my lifestyle choices. I did not have some sort of medical reason for my body not producing testosterone. So I'll go back to my doctor. I say, Doc, I don't want to be on this. Instead, I want you to run like all these tests. I went to like reverse engineered all the tests that they do at Cooper Clinic up in Dallas. And I said, I just want you to do all these tests, figure out some way to make insurance pay for it. And then I want you to tell me what I need to do, exercise, diet, lifestyle, all these things to make myself as healthy as possible so I can perform at my optimal uh, level for my kids and for my wife and for my family and for me. And my doctor just looked at me and was like, that's not really my job. Ooh. I don't have the time. I don't have the bandwidth. And that's not why I went to medical school. Um, and so I left dejected and was like, well, that's a bummer. What am I going to do? So I went on my journey. I went and hired a personal trainer. I went and hired a nutritionist. I went and hired a uh, health coach. I went, even went and saw a psychologist for mental health. Uh, I did, I, my doctor did help me get most of those tests done. It only cost me about you know, 800 bucks, 900 bucks to get them all done. Well, do you mind sharing what was, your, what was low testosterone for you? What, what, do you know what it was? It was like 390, okay. 400. I mean, it was. Because male, average male is what, 400 uh, or 300? You want to be about 400, 800. Okay. 400, 900. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. So I was on that lower end. But again, testosterone and well, hormones in general are very individual for everybody. That's why the range is so big. Uh, some people can be at 400 and be like, hey, I feel great. This is awesome. I, on the other hand, was at 400. It was like, I'm just lethargic. You know, I felt like that guy in. Uh, Zootopia at the DMV. Oh, yeah. Uh, sloth. <laughs> um, <laughs> and for an extrovert, you can imagine that's, yeah. you know, yeah. that, that's not compatible. Yeah. Eeyore. Um, so she got those tests done. I then took those tests around to all my little specialists that I had gotten. And after about six months and several thousand dollars, I had this awesome program. And of course, Next time I see all my friends, I'm like, hey, check out what I'm doing. This is awesome. I feel great. And they're like, oh, my God, I got to have that. What are you doing? Give me your program. Send me your what you did. And as soon as I would send them this, you know, 10 page word document on how to do it. Yeah, they were just like, yeah, no, I'm sorry. I, I don't have <laughs> I don't have the time or the bandwidth to do this. And so I just I was I had just left camp at that time and was doing a whole bunch of just self work on me. And I said, well, what if I did all this for you? put it on a silver platter and just made it super simple for you. Would you be interested? And they all said, yes. And I said, would you pay me? And he said, yes. But how much? And they gave me a price. And I was like, okay, I think we have something here. So 
that began the journey. I love I love that because one is like I was saying in the beginning of this episode is it's scratch your own itch. But two, that final piece of it of actually getting a payment for this thing that you have, because how many people have you met that are like, I have this great idea and I want to go start a business around it and they don't have a single customer or client and they've never even talked to anybody and they haven't made a quote unquote single sale yet. And then all of a sudden they like they they build the brand and they get the website and they uh, acquire the Instagram accounts and then they go out to sell it. And then all of a sudden they realize like nobody fucking wants what they have. Like how often does that happen? Right? Like, yeah, it's so common. So yeah. I'm sure the, the fact that you are just so natural in the sales realm served you very well in the sense of like, you understood maybe not, maybe logically or not, maybe, maybe just intuitively of like, I need to at least know this is something that I can sell before I build a business around it. Right? Oh, without a doubt. Uh, there's a great book called the mom test for any entrepreneur out there. I highly recommend looking at it. It's about this thick. It's tiny. So you can get, you know, if you have a short attention span like me, you'll get through it in a day. <laughs> uh, and it just does a great job of helping you package a questionnaire to go out and do market research to find out if you have product market fit. Mm -hmm. And before I spent money on this, I spent a whole month just cold calling people, asking anyone who, anyone in their dog who would talk to me. Cause I didn't know who my target market was. I didn't know what my price point was going to be. I didn't know all the features that people would want. So I just had a list laundry list of questions and the mom test really helps you formulate that questionnaire in such a way that you get real answers that are not subconsciously influenced, right? They're not leading questions. Uh, because if you go with an idea and you're like, Hey mom, I got this great idea. She's going to be like, oh, honey, that's great. I love that idea. That's the answer you don't want. So it teaches you how to ask these questions so you don't get that. Because the you know, first people you're going to ask are your friends. They don't want to hurt your feelings. They don't want to They don't want to make you feel bad. So they're just going to be like, yeah, it's a great idea. It's amazing. They go home and be like, that was the dumbest thing I ever heard. But you didn't hear that. Yeah. So you got to ask the questions in, in a right way. And so if you're out there building a business, I, I recommend that book. It's It's a great way to get started and find out if you have product market fit. I've never heard of it, but it's great. I mean, it, 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 right when you said the mom test, it immediately thought of like, yeah, when you go to your mom, of course yeah. she's going to be like, this is the best idea ever. You're the yeah. greatest, <laughs> yeah. right? But then you go to somebody that you don't know and you ask them to pull out their credit card, you're very quickly going to know like, That's right. is this actually valuable or not? That's right. Right? Is like getting a payment, which is obviously something you did, is like the best thing you can do because that shows people are actually interested enough to being willing to pay for it, right? Um, which is the start of any business at the end of the day, but, um, okay. So tell us some about the growing pains of Keyspan then. So obviously you found that product market fit. What was next? Where did you go from there? Well, from there we had to raise friends and family round cause we're bootstrapping. Uh, so raising that money, this is another sales job, right? You have to convince people to give you money and be like, Hey, give me $1. I'll give you $10 back. And they have to believe that. Uh, and in a pre-seed company, when you're, you know, you have pre-revenue, it's all just a belief in you as a person hmm. uh, and the business idea. There's really no concrete metrics for them to measure at that point. So again, very important sales job at that stage. Uh, and was, then was your initial funding all friends and family, or did you go? Yeah. You, did you go find investors at all? Uh, we, we found uh, venture I mean, capital. I, some of these friends and family are small investors. Got it. Okay. So, cool. Yeah. Um, and you know, most of the VC conversations we had were <clears throat> come back when you have some revenue, yeah. like the idea, like what you're building. Um, but we want to see traction. Can you give people maybe like some insights as to what that looks like from that friends and family pre-seed round of like, how are you finding these people? How are you deciding on who to reach out to? Like give, give some play by play maybe. Yeah, so the very first thing I say to anyone who gives me money is that you have to be prepared to lose it all. I, I'm a, a technically a first time founder. I have no idea what I'm doing. Uh, and uh, I mean, this is how the conversation goes. It's just as blunt as that. So you love the idea, you believe in me. I appreciate that, number one, whatever you give me, you have to be okay with losing all of it tomorrow and it's not gonna hurt you and it's not gonna hurt our friendship because I want friendship to come over this money. If you pass that test, then it's going to be like, okay, you have to realize that there's a high percentage chance, just statistically speaking from startups, that this is going to fail. You have to wrap your head around that. Okay. Can you add value in any way other than money? 
So are you interested in the space? Do you have connections that you can introduce me to? Uh, whether it be from you know an employee or advisor position or other investors, there has to be a role for that investor to play. Mm. Uh, so those are the three things that I have to check off when I'm talking to friends and family. And it's coming up on two years now? Since inception, yeah. Okay. Since ideation, yeah. And uh, how are things going? Things are going well. So we launched our beta a year ago in October. Uh, went live in April. Uh, and began our sort of B2B journey uh, in June. So it's um, it's just been going at a breakneck pace. And is that the gym as a clinic model? Mm -hmm. Is that that's the yeah. that's the new? Did it have to pivot into something into that or how? Did no, that... we had to sit here and think about how do we get in front of people if we don't have huge advertising budgets. So okay. where it, it was it was actually two calculations. The first was we are focused on four pillars of health, exercise, diet, lifestyle, and supplementation. And we are able to do the exercise, I mean, the diet, lifestyle, and supplementation parts phenomenally well, and behavior change and all of that good stuff. What we were struggling with was how do we deliver a compelling exercise component virtually? Because we don't have a physical location for you to go to. We can tell you the types of exercises to do, but how can we truly ensure that we're delivering the best results for somebody or the best advice for somebody where they're not going to get hurt because they try an exercise that maybe their range of motion is you know, not suited for? Well, we don't know what their range of motion is because we can't do a virtual assessment of them. And we played around with these AI virtual assessment stuff and it's just, it wasn't there yet. Uh, so that was one problem we were solving for. And the second problem was how do we get embedded into a community of people who want to be healthy and optimize their health and focus on prevention rather than waiting until they're sick? And the cross intersection of where those cross were gyms and fitness centers. People are going there. They want to be healthy. Gyms create community naturally by being in that gym. Uh, and we looked at the trainers and we noticed that conversations the trainers were having with their uh, clients, <laughs> frustratingly to all of the trainers, is always, please don't go home, Netflix and chill and order a pepperoni pizza. Please eat this, eat that, don't eat this, right? Trying to help coach them to manage their diet and lifestyle outside of the gym. But they're not trained, most trainers are not trained to do that. They're trained on movement and, and muscle and, uh, and the mechanics of the body. And so we're like, well, this is a perfect marriage. They are the experts in mechanics and movement. And we are the experts on lifestyle and behavior change and nutrition as it relates to what's going on inside your blood biomarkers. Mm. Let's marry those two. It's very symbiotic. Yeah. Full disclosure. So uh, my friend Nate Taylor here did allow me to try out Keyspan. And oh, yeah, and uh, got the blood work done. And for the record, I always hate getting blood drawn. Like I always like, get, I always get that like uh, I feel like I'm gonna pass out, nauseous feeling every single time I do it. Um, but anyways, it was great. Got my blood work done, and it was great because like it gave me, uh, it helped me with behavior change, which I think is the most important thing when it comes to data. Whether it's like this Garmin that I'm wearing, or like your your Whoop or your Ring or your lab work is like. It's all interesting data, but it's only useful if you actually do something about it. And it was great because like, it did definitely get me to do something about it because some markers to me that stood out, uh, one of them was like high cholesterol, which I found interesting. Um, I do eat a lot of red meat, so maybe that has something to do with it. Um, and then the other one, which was almost hilarious, was uh, the health coach when I got on a call with her. Uh, she's like, she's like, are you supplementing like B12 or something? She's like, because your B12 is literally off of the charts. And it was like, it was like a bazillion. And uh, <laughs> and I was like, well, uh, funny enough, uh, it was like the week or something before, a couple of weeks before I actually got my blood drawn. Uh, a friend of mine, she does mobile IVs. Yeah. And so she did an IV. Yeah. And I think in that IV was B12 along with a couple other things. Often is. Yeah. And, it, and it was just like through the friggin' roof. <laughs> <laughs> and so she was like very concerned. I was like, no, 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 like, don't worry. I'm not like doing this all the time. It was just like an IV thing. So it's totally fine. So I don't know what it is now, but I'm sure it's fine. But, uh, but just knowing those things obviously like gives you insights and like behavior change and like some basic things that I changed was like 
try to eat a little less red meat. Obviously, I'm always eating quite a bit of vegetables. And then also too, like the other one that I thought was interesting was like you mentioned dandelion tea. Um, I've definitely been drinking dandelion tea. I like tea in general, so why not? But just little things like that, right? Just like noticing the data and then making small behavior changes that obviously lead to hopefully preventative health. But yeah, I think it's great. I think it's awesome what you guys are doing. Right? Yeah. yeah um, it's, uh, it's habit stacking is one of the greatest behavior change tools you can deploy. It's the reason I love weight training as a base for everything. Yeah. I can tell you without question, I started weight training when I was about 17 years old. Yeah. And every other behavior, I, in my opinion, that I do from a health standpoint, whether it's like walking, eating healthy, trying to get a good night's sleep, drinking enough water, is the result of that initial behavior because they're all like trickle effects. Is like if I weight train, now all of a sudden I have an ide identity that I'm a healthy person and then I make other healthy decisions and just keep stacking on top of that one and that one and that one and just keep adding up. Um, but it all started when I was like 17. I'm 36 now and they just keep adding up. But I think it's a great basis for most people. And for some people, maybe it's like going on a walk. But there has to be like some base health behavior that you can just stack on top of that one and then do the next one and then do the next one. Um, I don't know if you've had that experience in your life, but yeah. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah. I mean, also, I was starting from a pretty low base of, of healthy activity when I started this. So uh, adding in uh, adding in things like the dandelion tea, I now couple it with apple cider vinegar and green tea. So I do two tea bags. I do apple cider vinegar, uh, put it all in. So there's three things I'm supposed to be doing. Uh, outside, I, um, I have like a half bolster that I lay on top of mm, yeah. to stretch my back out because I have terrible posture. And... Um, so working on my posture, I use that for a 15 minute meditation, I sit outside with my shirt off and get my vitamin D for 15 minutes. So, you know, have it stack at four things there that I'm going to get, you know, knocking off my list and, uh, in 15 minutes for, for one day. I like, love that. Neighbors probably think I'm weird. That's okay. Just as long as you're not like tanning your butthole, which, no. is, which is the thing in Austin. <laughs> so as long as they're not seeing that. They're yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did, did, didn't know that was a thing. It's All definitely right. a thing in Austin, <laughs> just in case you didn't know. I definitely have friends that do that. Fun fact. Um, where do you see the future of Keyspan going then? So obviously you're doing this more of a gym as a clinic model. Um, what's next for you guys then? Obviously that's going to be a big part of like partnering, community, um, affiliates. What's next? Yeah, so I think the next big thing for us is getting into uh, hormonal health, both for men and for women. Um and, you know, one of the things that I think excites me the most about the future is helping one of the largest and just shockingly most underserved populations in the world. It's women. They have been so misrepresented or underrepresented in the medical community since its inception. Uh, everyone, any woman out there will know what I'm talking about. Uh, and I think there's an incredible opportunity to help women through two key stages of their life. One is the, uh, the pregnancy and, and the natal stage as they're preparing to have babies and having babies and then postnatal, their bodies go under uh, big changes during those periods. And then the other one is peri, uh, and menopause, menopause and postmenopause, big changes and being able to support them from a nutrition, a lifestyle, exercise. And honestly, just having someone to talk to who's like, hey, that's normal. You're not losing your mind. You're not losing your body. This is what happens. And here's some ways to help mitigate that and make the impact of losing your estrogen uh, a little bit less stressful. I mean, it's always going to be a change, but I think there's a big opportunity there. The amount of women that have difficulties getting pregnant now is crazy. It is. It's actually wild. I mean, I'm sure it's partly hormonal, but also partly too of just how many people have been convinced that being on birth control is a good thing, only to eventually realize that it's not so great. I am in no way a doctor, nor do I have any uh, uh, definitive science on this. So uh, a big asterisk there, but I think it also needs to be uh, taken into account our living environments and the amount of toxins and chemicals and microplastics that we are exposed to. You know. It's not been proven if it's causal yet, but it's definitely correlation that men's testosterone, I mean, um, sperm counts are dropping and their mobility of their sperm is, is decreasing. Mobility? Yeah. So Your sperm have, mobility? Yeah. It swims. Ability for it to swim. Really? Yeah. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah. Huh. I wonder how mobile my sperm is. That's an interesting Again, question. Again, I'm not a doctor, so everyone check my science. <laughs> 
Uh, well, you're, it's not like you're Trump or anything. So we're not trying to sp spend all day fact checking to you, but um, okay. So I got a round. Oh, before we do, uh, I, we'll we'll do a round of rapid fire questions in a second here. But before we do, um, so you've had twenty plus years of sales experience. Yeah. Give somebody the the crash course. Like, what are what is like? If you if you were to give a one on one class and you were like this is the most important thing that I should know about sales, especially in the business world, what would you tell them? What's the what's the crash course version of that? <clears throat> I would say it's knowing your target market, what their problem is, and knowing that your solution solves that problem. And being able to determine that very quickly in the sales process so that you don't waste your time because you don't want to be spinning your wheels because there is one thing I have discovered in sales is that people, for some reason, do not like to say no. They will tell you any other excuse but no. And you want a no as a salesperson. If it's a no, you want it as early as possible. You don't want to be dragged out with a maybe or I don't know or I need more time or I don't have the money. Those are all what we call false objections. And so I think one of the biggest things is, is getting to that no and not being afraid of it. That no is a gift. It has just saved you hours of time. You have discovered that that is not a prospect for you. You need to move to the next one until you find the person who is your prospect. Then you consult with them and help them solve their problem. That's brilliant. I, uh, one of my, the very first thing I do on every sales calls is clarify why we're on the call. Mm -hmm. It's kind of that exact point. It's like, what are we here to yeah, talk why are about? We here? Why are we here? Like, what is this conversation about? It reminds me of that scene on, you ever seen Wolf on Wall Street? Yeah, of course. Where he sells him the pen. Have you, yeah. seen, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Where he's like, sell me this, there's something along the lines of like, sell me this pen. And then he goes like, well, how long are you in the market for a pen? And the other guy goes, well, I'm not. And he goes, well, I don't sell pens to people that are in the market for pens. And the and conversation ended right yeah. there. That's what it reminds me of, yeah. right? Is like, I'm not selling to somebody that's not in the market of what I'm selling. Right? No. Or you could take the other approach of, I have a, a million dollar check here, but uh, you need a pen to sign it. I'll sell this to you. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, so I got a round of rapid fire questions. It's whatever the first thing is that comes to mind. What's your best business advice? Do something you believe in for sure. What's your best marketing advice? Be consistent. What's your favorite part about being a business owner? Uh, having control of your vision and being able to see it come to life. Mm. I've been thinking a lot about vision lately, especially with everything Elon's been doing. That guy's so impressive. It's insane what he does. Uh, when are you the most productive? Oh, mornings, without a doubt. Who is your inspiration? Oh, so many people. Um, my uh, father is obviously one. Um, several of my managers that I've had and leaders that I've worked for uh, at LinkedIn, at Rackspace, uh, have all been inspirations to me. Um, and even some of my peers that I see go on and blow me out of the water. And they're even far more successful than I was in sales. I'm just like, wow, like I thought I was good. Like that's, that's impressive. Tell me one secret or something most people don't know about you. Um, one secret that people don't know about me. <clears throat> For my paternity leave, I was given three months off at LinkedIn as a dad with my daughter when she was born. So I used that time to go and hire studio musicians and I made an album of original music and I put that out and released it. What kind of music is it? Uh, it's sort of like Americana, Tom Petty-ish type stuff. Did you did you play it? Did you sing it? Like what did you yeah, do? Yeah, sing and, and play guitar and wrote the music. and A whole album? It was an EP, so five or six songs, yeah. How is it good? No. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but it was a lot of fun. Yeah. The most amazing thing was working with these uh, studio musicians because I'd be like, all right, so here's the 
guitar lines and he's like well what kind of solo do you want i'm like you know kind of mix like uh mike mccready from pearl jam with uh you know tom petty and he just like on his first take i was like oh my god that was amazing yeah that's exactly what i want <laughs> did you sell any it's on streaming so you don't sell on streaming okay uh but yes some of my parents and cousins who aren't on streaming services bought the album yeah love it yeah <laughs> That's the ultimate mom test right there. What would you change about yourself? Oh, man. Uh, what would I change about myself? Hmm. I mean, that would imply that there's something I don't like. Uh, so I'm not sure I can say it from that point of view. I think... Um, I would like to be able to train myself to be more disciplined to work output for longer hours. Mm. I, uh, I can only do work in like short bursts, mm. sit down for 30, 45 minutes and I get to get up, get up and walk around and go do something for 10, 15 minutes and come back down and sit down. And that breaks my chain of thought. Yep. Uh, but I mean, that's not new. That's my life. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting because, like, I think, I mean, that's, yeah, I mean, you mentioned the ADD, ADHD, whatever you want to call it earlier. And I, and I think also, too, is, like, I, I think a lot about, like, the type or the blocks in the day is, like, I, I call it rather, like, there's manager time and then there's, like, project time, basically. It's, like, manager time is more or less you have a bunch of calls, you're kind of jumping from one meeting to the next and you're doing one thing after the other thing and the other thing, right? And, like the value is in doing a bunch of different things is because you're having different calls and conversations mm -hmm. versus like the project time is where you sit down and focus yeah. for that block of time as opposed to doing multiple things. And I think honestly, like I think both can be trained and learned, but I do think certain people gravitate towards one or the other. I, I excel at the manager side. Yeah. I'm real good at jumping from thing to thing and being able to focus 10 minutes here, 15 minutes there. Right. Uh, it's that, you know, when I need to sit down and do a four hour project, totally. that's where it's just like, Oh my God. Okay. See, that's my jam, which is the weird thing. Uh, that's why I try to hire people like you. <laughs> uh, it's so important to find people who fill in your, your weaknesses. Well, it's like the Steve Jobs Wozniacki, right? It's like, yeah. I would argue the jobs is more like you and Wozniacki is more as like, I'm just want to sit down and code. Well, here's the other thing. It's about time value, yeah. right? So if I spend one hour perfecting my managerial uh, workflows, so that I can be more efficient at that, I will 10X myself. If I spend one hour trying to focus on some sort of system to allow me to sit down longer and concentrate on a long project, I'm only gonna go one X, totally. right? So that's again, find those people who fill in those gaps for you that uh, are your partners on the weaker side. And it's interesting as well, you would think there'd be a lot of personality clashes, but I find that actually the personalities gel really well. Um, they kind of just fit together like a puzzle piece. Yeah, yin and a yang. Yeah, for sure. It's really cool. It's something I'm actually just recently learning. And when just... you're too similar, that's when the clashes happen. Totally. Because you're like, no, that's my job. <laughs> <clears throat> well, also it 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 disproportionately weighs a business, right? Yeah. Is like I think that there's three parts to a business, in my opinion. I think there's sales and marketing. I think that there is operations, and I think that there is fulfillment. And generally speaking, fulfillment is more for like, I want to sit down and focus for long blocks of time. Sales and marketing is generally a little bit more managerial time and mm -hmm. operations is just like keeping everything running, whether it's like invoicing or responding to emails or whatever the case might be. Um, and so like when you have too many people in one of those categories, the business is overweighted in one category and they struggle because the other two just don't have what they need essentially to thrive. Yeah. Um, so what's your favorite app or resource right now? Oh, I'd have to say two of them. Uh, one is Anthropics um, Claude, mm. incredibly useful. And the other one is Yuka. What's that? Mm, Yuka is a really cool app. Uh, you open up, it's got a barcode scanner. You scan any sort of cleaning or skin or products that you have in your home or food products that you have, and it'll tell you how healthy it is on a scale of 100 and what are the hazardous or unhealthy components in there because nobody reads labels. But you can really easily look at a four out of 100 and be like, oh, I probably shouldn't eat goldfish. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah, Why? Yeah. And it just lists at the top. <laughs> hazardous, hazardous, hazardous. Yuka? Like, Yuka. How do you yeah. spell it? Y-U-K-A. It's a free app. Okay. Um, it's quite cool. 
um, I'll have to check it out. Yeah, it's great. And yeah. it's really fun to go through your home and just start scanning stuff. Yeah. You're going to realize real quickly how much junk Garbage. you put into your body or onto your body. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, what keeps you motivated? Um, I have this just born with the motivation to move forward. I, I don't know how to not. Uh, so I think I just have naturally need to be doing something. Yeah. It's the engine that's just going. Uh, <laughs> but if you want me to put a label on it, it would be every person that we get on our platform, we help. No one has come on and had a conversation with one of our health coaches after looking at their blood and left going, oh, well, I learned nothing. Yeah. Yeah, you might not stay with us for whatever reason it might be, but you're going to at least walk away with something. That's cool. And something that's going to make your life better. And what, that just can't can't beat that. What's your favorite part about Austin and you can't say the people? <laughs> oh, uh, can I say the music scene? Sure. Okay. Yeah. I'm a big live music fan. I we're, can tell. Yeah. You yeah. play guitar. You sing. Okay. Yeah. We're big supporters of uh, Austin City Limits, the, the PBS show. Um, love that. We got Sturgill Simpson tonight. I'm going to go see a taping for him. Wow. You're very um, involved. Love it. Okay. It's really fun. I love music. My wife also got really lucky. Married a girl who loves music as much as I do. Does she play? She she a jam? She doesn't. No. She keeps saying she wants to get a mixing table and oh. start doing some DJ mixing. Oh. Okay. So That's unique. We'll, we'll see what, what's in her future on that. Yeah. yeah. But again, she's a lawyer, busy, professional. We got two young kids. We don't have a lot of time to sit around and doodle around on instruments. Not yet, anyways. Not yet. But we are hoping the kids will get into it, and then we can sit around and have family music time. Yeah. Which would be cool. Cool. Um, I have one last question. Before I ask that question, though, I just want to acknowledge you uh, for just continuing to follow your passion and your energy. Like, you you obviously you mentioned it earlier about having to be interested in what you're doing, and I, and I think that's a vastly underestimated um, compass. I think that... Energy is the ultimate currency, and as long as you continue to follow it, um, you're going to do all right. And I just want to acknowledge the fact that you just you keep doing it, and now you're doing it with something in health, which is crazy, from all the industries you've been in. So it's cool. Can I throw it back at you? Sure. You started out, no one showed up to your first event, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, talk about persistence pays, <laughs> right? I know. It's crazy. People become more and more familiar with you and comfortable and see the value that you bring with the community that you build. Uh, I'm a big believer that community is the future of business thousand percent yeah yeah uh you need a community if your business doesn't have some component of community building it's gonna be a lot harder to attract and keep clients people are craving customers. it now they are we're so disconnected in everything else we do for sure yeah. and there's like a big trust issue too is like anything on the internet now is like there's always a degree of like you like you don't trust it as much um no like when was the last time you read a review <laughs> It's been a while. <laughs> yeah, met a guy at, uh, at one of our gym partners the other day I was talking to. He works for Mozilla, you know, the yeah, search engine yeah, or yeah, the, yeah. The, the browser. Yeah. Uh, and he was purchased by Mozilla. And he had a company that um, identifies fake reviews. Is there a lot? Oh, he was just like, yeah, <laughs> there's nothing out there that you can really trust unless they've been verified and there's some way of, of, Securing that verification, which is what his platform does. So I think, yeah, I think they, there, there are review farms. You go out and pay them and they just farm reviews for you. They're just fake. I uh, I recently went to a, a, this like event thing that my buddy's been hosting. He's been training a lot of people in the marketing space about how to use AI. Mm -hmm. And one of the very like first statistics that he brought up was that uh, almost 50% of all traffic on the website now is bots. Wow. Yeah. So even when you're looking at when you're mentioning that company or when you're looking at like your Google Analytics or whatever, it's all lots, like half, about half of it. I think that might be generous. I wonder if it's not more with AI. Now. <laughs> you see, so Anthropic just uh, released this thing where it's uh, computer screen screen control. You can now control with AI to tell it to your mouse go here, click this, type this in. It it records keystrokes and mouse movement. And then you can just leave it on autopilot and it'll just go do repetitive tasks on your desktop. Get out of here. Yeah. So we're entering a very new world. And this election cycle is not helping us trust anything. 
No, and and like wow, this is this is gonna be the most political thing I've ever said on the show. But I, what I'm finding very interesting right now, and I never talk politics, politi- politics. I hate politics. I don't talk about it with anybody. I don't. It's like uh, there's a no-win situation. No, no. <laughs> yeah. But I will say something that's really interesting since the election is so close is that I think one of the things that Trump ir- ironically is doing really well is that he's just being real. Even if he says a lot of stupid things and you don't believe in him, he's like the only politician that it's like. He's just saying what he thinks and feels. And I think he's going to win a lot of votes just on principle of just like all the other politicians is like they kind of feel scripted. They're kind of like hiding behind screens mm-hmm. They're like they don't really like they don't feel like real people. They feel like A.I. And I think he's going to win a lot of votes just for being just raw. I think so many people just are gravitating towards that. And like, yeah. who knows what will happen? But I just find it really interesting right now. Yeah. It'd but, be interesting. Is that the, is that the personality you want negotiating with the foreign power? <laughs> <laughs> raw and real and just I says whatever know. he wants i know i don't know he says a lot of crazy things yeah. but did you listen to his podcast interview with, with joe, joe rogan? rogan no yeah. i haven't done that yet See, I, even that right like even that alone that was like three hours right yeah, yeah even that alone is fascinating that a, a quote-unquote politician is willing to get on just a private yeah. podcast show and just talk whatever for three hours like i will say this for the marketing folks pod- podcasts are the way oh for sure yeah also add to that as somebody who does one. Um, I mean, I, I truly think that this is where you get the real stuff. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Because, you know, everything that we're putting out in an ad or whatever it is, I mean, that's been thought over by committees for hours. <laughs> like, oh, well, should it be this word? Should it be that word? What color should it be? What what picture should we put in there? You know, yeah. who's it going to resonate with the most? Totally. I don't know. I have no idea who's going to resonate with this conversation. <laughs> Well, people keep talking about how like our attention spans are getting shorter and yeah. yada, yada, yada. And you only have so many seconds to capture somebody. And there's a there's a nugget of truth. There's always a nugget of truth in everything. The nugget of truth in that is that you do. It is helpful to capture somebody quickly. That's the point of a hook of a post sure. or the hook of a video or whatever the case. There is truth to that statement. Yeah. But deeper than that is people are actually craving long form and more in depth and more um connection at the end of the day is that longer form creates that connection mm-hmm. so like even if it requires a hook to get them in there they do want to stick around if you give them a reason to at the end of the day are you finding that with your your podcast episodes like the longer interviews that you have getting more engagement than some of your shorter ones yes yeah generally speaking yeah. yeah but again the trick is is like you have to give them a reason yeah there's to gotta stick be around. the hook there yeah you got to give them a reason and it, it's not it's not it's not fake. It's not a lie. It's like, this is what we're going to talk about. It's sales. This is the value you're going to get out of it. <laughs> Let's get into it. Yeah. Right. I'm not trying to trick people. I'm not no. trying to clickbait. There's no. none of that. Like that's stupid. When you clickbait somebody, ultimately that just diminishes the long term of that relationship because like then they don't trust you. Or your brand value goes way down. A thousand percent. Yeah. Who so, is it? Buzzfeed that does that? Yeah. 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 They, I mean, they used to do it a lot. Yeah. I don't think you see it as much as good because people know better now. But yeah. Um, but yeah, you're not trying to trick people. That's stupid. Don't it do is. that. But totally agree with that. But you do have to give them intrigue, right? You do have to yeah. like entertain them on so some level. Just be entertaining. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and well, on some level, everybody is entertaining somewhere, somehow. Yeah, for sure. You, if know? you know your medium, right? Yeah. Like uh, some people are good at writing. Some people are good know at speaking. Know your story and know your audience. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Um, Last question. Yeah. It's really whatever your best piece of advice is. So if you were to go back to ground zero of Keyspan or really any business for that matter, and you were to give advice to your younger self or anybody in that circumstance that was just getting started, what would you tell them? Um, surround yourself with people that are smarter than you and fill in your gaps and don't be afraid of that. Lean into those gaps. Be like, hey, I suck at this. Like, I... The first question I'm like, are you organized? Can you keep things organized? Because I'm not organized. You can? Good. How are you working with someone who's unorganized? You're good with that? Okay, cool. All right. I think I think we can work together then. Uh, because um, that's how you're going to just get over those hills. You are your own blocker on those areas that are your weak points. And if you don't have people that are complimenting that and helping you carry you over those hills, then it's gonna be it's gonna be really hard journey. Um, so that's my biggest advice: surround yourself with people that are smarter than you and compliment your weaknesses. The irony in that is that I'm literally feel like I'm just I'm just learning that on a higher level. Like I said, I was just on that trip in Florida with my buddies and one of my best friends. He owns eight Jimmy John's locations and they're doing very well. And he could retire if he wanted to, but um, 
something that I've admired him for for a long time is his ability to do exactly what you're talking about. Is like he's not the one making the sandwiches. He's not the one running the stores. It's like he's just found ways to hire people that are better or smarter than him mm -hmm. at those things mm -hmm. and just surrounding himself with great people. Mm -hmm. And it's served him very well. Yeah. And make him happy. Yeah. 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 Be, be good to him. Yeah. 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 Thanks for being on the show. Hey friend, thanks for listening to the show. If you have any feedback for me about the show or any other guests you'd like to see come on, definitely shoot me a message. I love engaging with my audience so that I can provide the most value possible to the listeners. Before you go, I only have one ask of you and that would be to check out the Health Hustle newsletter. It's three marketing tips that's written every Tuesday specifically for health-related business owners to help them attract new leads. If you click the link in the description, it'll take you to the archive of all my previous newsletters and you can decide for yourself if it's for you. If you end up finding it entertaining or helpful in any way, you can sign up for the newsletter and you'll get it in your inbox every Tuesday. Thanks again and keep hustling, my friends.